Maybe if you don't see well enough, you can come a bit uh, closer. Okay, good morning. So today I will talk about uh, one topic that uh, I used in my practical programming experience. Uh, I've used functional programming in various languages um, and I just wanted to explore and see what can we do with it in, in C++. Uh, and uh, by the way, you can find the slides already on SlideShare. So if you go SlideShare slash Alex Bolli, you'll find there the whole slides and you have clickable links inside and they take you to the GitHub repos and everything. So if you want just to take a photo of this or write down the URL, uh, then it would be easy to look at them again. Um, okay, so what? What I will be talking about, uh, let, I'll do first a bit of intro and then move on the practicalities of using functional programming. Um, and the most important thing from this talk is the mindset. Uh, the other things are about how to write the core building blocks in C++ and how to improve design and when from my experience, design has gone bad when I've used functional programming. So we'll talk about this and we'll end on a discussion was the relation between object-oriented and functional programming. Um, and before I start, uh, just a quick bit about myself. I identify myself with the software craft movement, which means that I want to practice and learn as much about software programming and um, I do this in communities, I talk to people, I pair with people and um, by doing so I noticed some very interesting things. First we keep recycling ideas, like now we have cloud which is the new mainframe and we have microservices which is the new uh, Unix processes and all these ideas are fairly old and so um, Functional programming is one of the oldest things in programming. It predates object-oriented as far as I know. Um, and I think it's a very useful tool to have in your bag even if you don't use it all the time. So I wanted to learn more about it. Um, I also noticed that whenever you get, m you have more restrictions on how you write code, your code is typically better. Uh, as programmers, we like freedom. I loved freedom as a junior programmer, but then my freedom hit me in the head again and again and again. Um, and having a discipline that says, okay, let's do immutable things immutable as much as possible is something that uh, helps a lot. I'm not an expert in functional programming, and I think it's fair to say that I'm not an expert in C++ because that's a very hard thing to achieve. I wrote no books on C++. I'm not in any committee, uh, but I like to, to practice. So you'll see a practical view. Um, another short disclaimer, I will have code on my slides, but the code sometimes will not be exact syntax. Uh, you will find all the code with the proper syntax and working and with tests on my GitHub repository. Right, so has any one of you, what was your start with functional programming? Who learned functional programming in university? Okay, was this good? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this was my first touch of functional programming and when I saw this type of code, the only thing I really wanted was to write sequences and if statements in for loops and translate them in another language. So basically I would write structure programming in functional languages. This was what I was trying to do. And if you try to learn more about functional programming today, you read about statements like this. The essence of monad is the separation of composition timeline from the compose compo 
expectations, execution timeline, as well as the ability of computation to implicitly carry extra data as pertaining to the computation itself, in addition to its one hence the name output that it will produce when run. Who understood this? It's a real question, so I want somebody to explain it to me because I don't. <laughs> but maybe there's a shorter explanation, so ready? All told, the modern is X is just a monoid in the category of endo functors of X with product replaced by composition of endo functors and units set by the identity endo functor. And if you don't understand this, then you can learn category theory. <laughs> so this just gave me a big, big headache. And I tried to learn about these things and Really, I loved mathematics. It was one of my favorite topics, but I'm so far away from mathematics now that I, I don't understand these things anymore. So I wanted a practical view. And initially I thought that I was dealing with a very convoluted way of writing code in a community that likes very complicated explanations because they are all mathematicians. Um, but Almost 20 years later, I started to get it. And it's about a style of software design. It's a style of software design where we focus on functions and immutability. And we use those in order to remove certain types of duplication and to in improve how we transmit the intent in our code. And this brings us to the mindset. Uh, the object-oriented mindset is mostly about designing objects and message passing. And the key idea there is how about designing the messages? Uh, we have small things that are independent, kind of like cells, and this was the initial, at least one of the initial metaphors. We have separate cells that communicate through messages, and that's the core of object-oriented. But in functional programming, we think differently. We think about, we have this set of input data, and we want to get to this output data. And then how do we do that? We apply a set of transformations on the data. And each set of transformation is a, a pure function. So a very simple example, if you want to do this in like the structured way, it's the simple for loop where you Let's say we want to increment all the elements of a list. It's a simple for loop. You uh, rewrite the structure usually, things like this. This is what I learned as a junior programmer or in university. How it is in functional programming where we think about what's the input? The input is this list, what's the output? It's another list. It's a list that has all the incremented values from the first list. So how do you do that? we apply a high-level function that says, transform for me this list by applying this element on the each, uh, this uh, transformation on each element. And I get another list. And it goes even further because if you think about, let's say for some reason we need 5T characters. I don't know why you would need that, but it's an interesting example. Um, that's the typical way of writing it structure programming, how do we do it in functional programming? Where we think again about what's the input data? The input data is actually a range. It's a range from one to five. By the way, not from zero to four, because who does that? It's from one to five, we want five things. Um, and, and then I want to apply a transformation that says just return me a T and then create a string out of this. So, we have these um, types of transformations, and I couldn't find the range yet. Maybe in C++, I know there's a range in Boost. So I just wrote the, the groovy code that does this. Um, and I noticed, okay, there's a Boost way of doing this, but I don't know if it will be something in the standard or not. Let's go to a more complex example. So I like to use games. I like to play around with writing code for various games uh, with various constraints. So to figure out how, um, 
how I can design my code in different ways. And if you think about the Pac-Man problem, everybody knows Pac-Man game? Anybody never heard of Pac-Man? <laughs> I have to ask because <laughs> you never know nowadays. Um, <laughs> fairly old game. Um, if you think about it in object-oriented, what you do is you start by figuring out what notions, what are the classes, what are the things involved in this. And maybe you create stuff like pac-man, board, dot, wall, movement, things like this. And you then figure out how they interact. What's the message passing there? If you do it in functional programming, it's a completely different way because the input data is basically a line with pac-man on it. And that's really how pac-man was, right? So that's one, <laughs> one part of the real pac-man game. The data out is something like this, where I have an empty space and Pac-Man has eaten a dog. So now if I only think in data, what I can do is to say, okay, let's get everything before Pac-Man, let's get everything after, and then write something like recompose this in a new structure, and I get something like this. So it's a fairly interesting, different way of thinking about uh, how to implement uh, programs, how to design your code. And you can find the full example here if you're interested. Uh, it runs, it has tests. It's, it's fairly easy to, to try out. So this brings us to the conclusion. So the mindset is different. The mindset is about data. Data input, data output, transformations, each transformation being a pure function, which I'll immediately go into. And of course, this doesn't involve the edge of the system. That's a very common question. So what do you do with database? What do you do with input? What do you do? That's different, right? Anything that's input and output is different from the immutable functions. But every, most applications have the things inside these boundaries the things that don't talk with input and output, they can be immutable. So unless you are doing a very heavy input-output product, uh, this can help. But in order to apply this mindset, we need some building blocks. We need a way to express this in a programming language, because until now we only spoke about concepts. So how do you think about it? But how do you do it in a real language? And I mentioned pure functions a few times, and the definition of pure functions is whenever you get the same input, you will get the same output. It doesn't depend on stuff around it. Well, maybe except for things like there's not enough memory or, uh, but it doesn't have a lot of side effects. It doesn't have a lot of dependencies. Uh, and typically if you write functions in C++ that have everything const, that's kind of where you, you have pure functions. Um, and an example here, a very simple example, is if you think of a list, I have an insert function on a list. But now the question is, this depends on how many elements already are in the list. Maybe the list has a limit of, I don't know, max int or whatever. Right? And then if I go overboard, it will throw an exception or something like this. But I don't know. So sometimes insert will do that. Sometimes insert will do the other thing. Um, and so typically in functional languages, what you'll see is that you pass in everything. And then you can check whether this works under a very defined condition. And it's much easier to write tests for this kind of functions, by the way, because you control the input, you know what the output should be. And we have immutability. There are still edge cases, of course, like not enough memory, not enough uh, things like this. Um, and this takes us to sometimes, especially in functional languages, people use immutable uh, collections. And this is an example that I found on GitHub about immutable collections. Uh, it's a fairly short example. I think it's inspired by Haskell, but uh, it, 
I think it's interesting to see. And you see that every time I push something, I get a new collection, a new collection, a new collection. This doesn't say anything, by the way, about the implementation. So the implementation can still be optimized. We can still have pointers, uh, so not create a whole list and copy it over and over, but rather move the pointer so that it works um, like a, a new list. Okay, and this takes us to lambda. Um, if one of the most common ways of writing functions in functional programming, we need functions, we can write lambdas. Um, and this is a fairly simple example of lambda. I guess you, you've seen it in C++. That's the kind of uh, syntax that works. And when I first saw this, I had two questions. One, why don't I have here like a, an arrow like in all the other programming languages? But it's probably because of overloading the arrow symbols so many times. And the other question was, what's with these square brackets? <laughs> Those are weird. But it turns out that, of course, since we are in C++, we need to specify if we want to do something like this. We have a value here in the context that we are using inside the function. We need to specify that we want to actually capture that, func that value and how do we want to capture it. Do we want to capture it by value, by reference, by you know, all these nice things about C++. Uh, fortunately, there is an easier way, right? So we can always say, just give me everything I'm using here as a um, as a value, um, and I highly recommend uh, cppreference.com website. It's really good for shows a lot of examples. You can use it. It's I enjoyed it a lot. So this takes us to food, <laughs> right? Curry, <laughs> not this curry. This curry. <laughs> this is a guy who so is a mathematician who was so cool that they named two things in computer science after him. Curry and Haskell. <laughs> so, um, and what curry means is basically, I want to create a new function where I have, from another function, I have a function with two parameters, but I want to bind one parameter to a value and get another function that only gets one parameter. And that's what currying is. And uh, in, of course, because we cannot name things the same in all programming languages, this is called bind in C++. So even if it's, the operation is currying, this is bind. And that's basically the syntax. So here, if I do add on, let's say, on an empty list, I can bind it already to an empty list. And that's a way of removing a certain type of duplication. Because if you keep creating lists, probably you'll start from an empty list and add to it. But then if you keep writing empty list, empty list, empty list, empty list, at some point you get annoyed. And so you say, how about binding this and having a function that just says add to empty list? I don't care. And it works. Uh, so this brings us to another characteristic of functional programming where you typically tend to chain functions. And you uh, add to add to add to add to empty list, and that's a list. Right? Um, and this is, again, a type of construct that keeps appearing. So it would be nice if we could group the functions and say, I want to have another functions. That means it's a combination, it's a composition of two functions. If you remember your math, that was very, like in, I think in high school, we did uh, f of g of x. That's basically what we're trying to do. I couldn't find a way of doing this in C++. Maybe there is, but I don't know. Um, but in Groovy, you can write something like this. 
and this creates your new function that's the combination of the two, and then you can write uh, and use that function. Um, okay, so we have composability, and now we bring the food back in. We need some spice, right? So how do we spice? We add some curry to the composability, and we can write things like, let's say, I want to have something that has two elements, and then for some reason, I keep using a list with zero and one. Everybody needs a list with zero and one, so I keep reusing that, but I don't want to keep writing that. And then I can bind um, the values, and I can get this list. And of course, we go to high level. We get meta, right? We can pass functions to functions. Um, and that's a very fairly simple handwritten way. I was surprised to see that it works because I was expecting some more <laughs> shenanigans there, <laughs> but it just works. So that's, that's really cool. Um, and we already have high level functions that we can use. And that's not new for C++. I mean, I've been using pointer to functions and functors, and now Lambda is just the next iteration of this. But I would still like to have a simplified way of writing things like transform and so on. I understand they usually work on ranges, but that what I'd really like is to pass in a collection. So I ended up by writing my own simplified transform that just gets a collection and does the correct resize, and I can use it like in, in most other languages. So find if finds the first element, transform, turns all elements from a collection um, into another collection, apply the s applies the transform on each element. Uh, we have reduce or accumulate. Reduce didn't work on my G++ compiler yet. Probably it will come. Uh, but we can still use accumulate, which adds up things. I notice there's also transform reduce function that will probably be available. Um, and also very interesting, all of, any of, none of, which means I can apply Boolean operations on, on a collection and get a result. The nice thing about most of these functions is that I can also pass in uh, execution policy and say, I want this to be run in parallel. And I don't care about threads. I don't care about anything else. It just works, which is one of the great things about functional programming. Of course, as long as you use pure functions, because if you start changing stuff, then you'll get into troubles. Um, and I'm going to go even more meta now, because almost anything can be a function. Uh, there's something called church encodings, which I don't fully understand. But uh, I find the exercise of writing them in various languages very useful, because it shows me how far you can go with, with the functional concepts in that language. So what this does is basically rewrites the Boolean type as functions. And I'm not going to go into details here, you can find on GitHub the whole implementation, but basically true is a function, false is a function, if is a function, and it does a lot of weird things, and you can do this in C++, which is, it was again a bit of a surprise, good surprise for me. So, uh, I said in the beginning, you know, functional programming is about a few things, it's about data in, data out transformations. We write transformations using pure functions, and what we want is to have uh, then ways of removing certain types of duplication. When you pass in the same parameter multiple times, use curry. When you combine two functions multiple times, use functional composition. Um, when of course, reuse existing functions. We already have functions written that can help us do map, reduce, all these interesting transformations. Um, and one additional thing is that the best functions here are very small. 
and polymorphic. So the idea with functional programming is to have functions that I can use in various different contexts. So they don't depend as much on the type, they don't depend as much on uh, you know, what I'm passing in. But basically if you have a plus on two types, it should work and all these things. Uh, and this allows us to write little code that covers a lot of things and to write small functions that we then compose, compose, compose until we get to high complexity. So, okay, so can this help us? And the first candidate is loops. And my problem with traditional loops is that if I just give you this, you have no idea what it's doing. It doesn't tell you the intent. What am I trying to do here? Because my intent is not to iterate over a collection, never. My intent is to get something out of it. My intent is to find something there, to get a new collection that has other elements, to whatever, right? I never intend to write this. So when I use functional loops, I'm much more intentional. The code just tells me what it does. So if you read something like this, transform list of increments, I don't even know what's in the, the list, right? But I know that now I will have a new list with all incremented values inside. And of course it takes a while until I manage to understand like the basic syntax and all that. But once I can read that, it's much easier to understand what it does. And of course, it's very important to have short functions because otherwise, if you have like a really huge function here that you don't know how to name, you won't be able to say what it does. Um, and you can even read something like this, right? So I increment the elements from a list and then I find the even numbers and then I append all of those and I get that. It's fairly easy. It's one line of code that expresses a lot of functionality. Um, and I like to talk a bit about web applications. I know we are not probably not doing a lot of that in this room, but web applications are one of the type of applications where we think about, okay, but can we do immutability? And I want to encourage you to think on every one of your applications, uh, like what can be immutable. Um, because here, basically, if you think in functional concepts, you get an HTTP request and you need to get out a something, some HTML and a response for it, right? And maybe to save something. So what this means is that I can do a lot of transformations and only two of those are actually mutable. All the other things are fairly immutable. And again, unless you are doing very input output heavy applications, whose only reason is, I don't know, to copy a file or to do things like this, you can probably benefit from immutability. It doesn't always go well though. And I know from my personal experience and when I tried various experiments with functional programming, I ended up in a, in a bad place. And this is an example, it's again the Pac-Man version but in, in Groovy. The code is pretty nice, it's okay, you can read it. But the problem is the level of abstraction went high. So now in order to understand this, I need to understand What's an axis? Why do I care about an axis? Uh, what am I computing there? What's the next board? And all, all these things, they require me to understand a bit more. And I had this feeling the first time I, I paired with a Haskell programmer and I said, okay, so let's try and do a web application. And he looked at me very surprised because apparently Haskell programmers don't do web applications. Uh, I don't know what they do, but it's not that. Uh, and then he said, okay, so let's try a web framework. And we got the best reviewed web framework for Haskell. And then it took us about an hour just to understand the types from that framework. Because those types got so abstract 
that it was very hard to kind of wrap your mind around what the author of the framework was trying to do. And this is one danger that we have because since we can write functions and then remove duplication, we get more abstract functions, we get more abstract types, and we end up with things that are not really easy to understand by somebody who's just coming into the project. Uh, so this is one challenge. Another challenge that I've had was, this is a very simple piece of code. I wrote this in Python. Uh, it works, it's tested, it's small, I'm still afraid to change it. <laughs> and the reason is uh, I went into this weird combination of functional programming and object-oriented, and now I no longer understand what he's doing, and I wrote it. <laughs> so, so there's a real danger here of mixing paradigms, and it goes, it's not a big piece of code, but it will take me a while to, to understand. Uh, so it's a real danger here of understanding and figuring out what's the simplest thing, the thing that can actually be read by a new programmer that comes in your team or by one of your more junior colleagues and so on. There's this kind of vocabulary that you need to build in order for them to understand what's going on there. Right, and this brings me to the end, the last topic, uh, which is what's the relation between object-oriented and functions? I think about software design as being ways of structuring our code, and we structure our code in different ways depending on the paradigms that we are using. But object-oriented and functional programming are still code. So at the end, you end up with something that executes with certain structures and so on. So I had something was bugging me for a very long time, like, is there a, an equivalence? Can we translate object-oriented into functional? Can we do it the other way around? Because it seems logical to have, if we are solving the same problem, but with different paradigms, it seems logical to have a certain relationship between the resulting code structure. And at some point we had uh, a friend, J.B. Rainsberger, in our office, and he told me, you know, I've read this, and this solved my problem. He said, a class is nothing more than a set of cohesive, partially applied pure functions. What does this mean? Well, cohesive means that we put functions in a class that make sense together, hopefully. Because if they are not cohesive, then you have a different problem than paradigms. Okay. You have a big design problem. <laughs> um, what is partially applied? Well, when you think about uh, the difference between a class and a functional approach, the difference is that in a class, I already have some data memory. And that's exactly like binding that parameter to all the functions from the class. And that's kind of the equivalent. So I can write functions that have this you know, list parameter, which is actually something like list storage. And the equivalent, so the, the object-oriented style would be write a class, have a storage, and so on. The functional style would be, okay, how about binding for the add functions the initial list storage, and then we just work with those functions. And it works in this way. That's the highest level of equivalence that we can use. So I think this is very interesting because it solves one of my conundrums. How do you deal with it? And you can actually mix paradigms, but you have to be fairly careful about how you mix them because it can become confusing at times. So improving design. Can we improve design? Well, the good thing about functional is if you're using, if you have any type of data manipulation, any type of um, computation, you can use these concepts. High-level functions, 
they give me intent. They show me what I am trying to do. I don't write a for loop. I don't like write an if statement. I just do various types of transformations that I can understand. Um, another advantage is it's very easy to test pure functions. You have the inputs, you have the outputs. It's fairly easy. There is no uh, connection to the outside world. And I highly recommend you to separate mutable and immutable states. Make as much as possible in your code immutable. Make everything conk in <laughs> C++ until you cannot make things conk anymore. And that's, um, because then it's much easier to reason about the code. It's much easier to understand what he's doing. Now we have to be careful whenever we go too high on abstraction planes. Like we still want people to understand the code. And I feel this is one of the main problems in, in the Haskell community, at least the code that I've seen. It's fairly difficult to understand the code uh, or to come and modify it unless you kind of read the mind of the people who wrote it. It's fairly difficult. So it helps if you have right names, if you have very precise names, names that tell me exactly what they do. And whenever we go too abstract, maybe leave a little bit of duplication there. Because maybe it's a bit better than just having very abstract um, ideas. And since it's confusing to mix object-oriented and functional, we have to pay attention to this. So sometimes, ideally, you would have like separate modules things like this. And this is more functional, this is more object-oriented, at least you know what your context is. <coughs> now, of course, uh, functional programming is now everywhere. Uh, all modern languages have this, C++ has this, no reason not to use it. Um, and we can't really ignore it. Uh, and there are new applications like on big data, like there was a big MapReduce thing at Google a few years ago. Um, reactive programming is basically functional programming re at a higher level, uh, reorganized. Um, and if you want to go into things like artificial intelligence, that's where composability is fairly useful. Um, so there's no reason not to try it. But what I encourage you to do is to actually try it on small problems, make experiments, try to get into the mindset, and then see how you can apply it on your, on your production code. Because it might be uh, a bit stranger at first, like to wrap your mind <laughs> in this way. I know it was hard for me to go to data in, data out, and the ba very basic uh, way of thinking. If you want to learn more, again, if you go to SlideShare slash Alex Ball, you will find more slides um, on this topic. I also have recorded sessions with these. Uh, the first topic is about refactoring loops, uh, and even loops that are a bit hidden inside your code. Find them, refactor them so they in a functional way so that you understand what they are doing, and you can extend them. And it's a whole com discussion there of why it's good, why it's bad, and so on. So it's not only about this is the way you should do it. <laughs> it's also about this is what you need to pay attention to. And removing structural duplication, another very common pattern that I've seen, uh, and that you can, uh, if you go through the slides again with various examples, you will see how, how you can do this using higher level functions. Uh, just a quick plug, if you want to learn more, uh, join me or my colleagues uh, for C++ workshops, you'll find information at our booth. Just ask us uh, if you are interested in anything. Right, I've been Alex. It's a very nice, uh, it's very nice for me to be here. Uh, I am programmer, trainer, and coach at Mosaic Works. And C++ was my first language, and I still haven't forgotten it. I still enjoy it. Uh, 
uh, I work with customers on it. And as we say at Mosaic Course, I like to leave you with one thing, think design and work smart. Thank you. you have questions I think we have a few minutes left if not you can find me <laughs> later on